Welcome to today's Reef Resilience Network webinar. We are so excited to have everyone here today to learn about the Global Fund for Coral Reefs. My name is Petra McGowan and I'm the director of the Reef Resilience Network and your host for today. The Reef Resilience Network, for those of you that haven't joined us before, we connect reef managers and practitioners to the latest science strategies and tools through online and in-person trainings. So thanks for joining today. This webinar is brought to you in collaboration with the Global Fund for Coral Reefs and support from NOAA's Coral Reef Conservation Program and the Nature Conservancy. So before we start the presentation today, I'm gonna to go over a few housekeeping items. So today's webinar is one hour in length and there's gonna be two times for you to ask questions. There are two ways you can ask questions. You can use the question box right here on the slide. You can see um, any time during the webinar, you can send a question and I'll be keeping track of these for the Q&A sessions. You can also raise your hand during the question sessions of the webinar and then I will unmute you and take your question at that time. You raise your hand by clicking on the small hand icon on the toolbar to the left of your name. Um, when I unmute you, um, you might have to unmute yourself as well. So if you're having any technical difficulties, such as trouble hearing or seeing the slides, you can send us a message via the question box and we will try to resolve that issue. So also this whole webinar is being recorded and it will be posted on the Reef Resilience Network um, website. So I'd now like to hand it over to David Myers, Executive Director of the Conservation Finance Alliance for our presentation today. David, thanks for joining us. Petra, thank you for having me. Sorry, <clears throat> um, very, uh, very pleased to be here and um, thank you so much for hosting this webinar. Um, we are uh, excited to share with you um, a completely white screen, same, same problem as we had last time. Um, let me try to uh, undo it and do it again here. Um, the uh, first part of the presentation, if we can get it up, um, will be uh, going over sort of what the, the, the Global Fund for Coral Reefs is and um, what stage it's at right now. And then the second part, we'll, we'll take a little break then, and the second part will um, create um, an opportunity for um, uh, diving deeper into our request for information, which is part of a, a process to establish uh, an investment plan that the Conservation Finance Alliance has been engaged to, to, to support, to provide that uh, technical support to the fund. And um, we are, um, experiencing some, some technical difficulties, but um, thank you very much for, for uh, bringing up that, that presentation. So, um, so great. So the first slide shows some of the, uh, sort of the partners that, that, that have started this fund. The Global Fund for Coral Reefs was a, um, is a, is a philanthropic public and private collaboration. And you can see different uh, philanthropies here um, that have led the process and private companies BNP Paribas and Ophelia, as well as uh, different UN agencies. And um, the uh, next slide, um, we'll give, we'll start with the introduction to, to why the fund is so important, which is that, you know, as, as you know very well, um, being uh, act, people active in, the, in coral reef management and conservation, the reefs are extremely at risk. Um, the numbers are, are, are frightening, the um, you know, historical, uh, bleaching events are, are, are coming at more and more frequency and, and having greater impact. Of course, uh, the longer term prospects are, are challenging. And, and so, um, you know, we really do need to, to act soon and act decisively. And that's, that's part of the reason for the, for the fund. The next slide um, just uh, explains, uh, you know, that how important coral reefs are. Um, um, I think that most people are familiar with some of the economic numbers. Of course, coral reefs uh, provide enormous uh, protection from storm damage. They pro provide beach protection. They uh, obviously are nurseries and, and uh, storehouses of biodiversity and uh, all kinds of other benefits. But there's a lot of, uh, of local people that are 
directly dependent on the coral reefs for their livelihoods, and, and this is really important to, to consider. The next slide um, will kind of shows that, that currently the amount of money that's being invested to conserve coral reefs is, is relatively low. Um, a couple indicators here that, you know, there uh, was a, an assessment from the, the high level panel years ago that showed that um, we need about seven times the amount uh, that's currently being invested. And uh, one more click brings up a little figure down below that, you know, indicates how 0.01% of climate finance from development banks from 2010 to 2015 went to coral reefs. So, you know, climate adaptation, obviously the reefs are, are under extreme stress and yet very little money is going to, to fund them. Next slide, um, we'll start to introduce the, the fund here, the Global Fund for Coral Reefs, uh, GFCR. Um, the goal here is to try to unlock major investment towards coral reef conservation and restoration in developing countries. And um, secondly, to facilitate transformation of the economies and livelihoods around those reefs to, to um, reduce the important uh, drivers of, of coral reef degradation. So more money, more investment, and reduced um, harmful impacts from the drivers. Next slide um, is an introduction to a concept called blended finance. And blended finance is defined here as the use of catalytical, catalytic capital from public, so government or philanthropic sources to increase private sector investment in sustainable development. And uh, Convergence, um, an organization that tracks this, has, has uh, noted that uh, blended finance has mobilized $140 billion to date. It's actually been going on for quite some time. Um, this is where you're, you have public and private working together to, to help finance things. So. Um, and so what the fund is seeking to do is to build on um, the blended finance concept. In the next slide, you know, you'll see that um, the, some of the, the, the goals here of the, of the fund here are to incubate, identify and incubate a project pipeline of revenue generating mechanisms. So to make a blended finance system work, you, to, to make um, the private, to encourage the private sector to invest you need to have returns uh, for that private sector. So we're really looking for, for revenue generating opportunities here. Um, concessional, second part is concessional loans and loan guarantees uh, from the global, uh, the, sorry, the Green Climate Fund and other sources can de-risk investments and increase the attractiveness. So you're looking at a combination of, of returns, the level of returns and the level of risk. And so these concessional loans and guarantees can de-risk making the returns that are flat, could be slightly lower, much more attractive because they're less risky. Um, third, um, we wanna try to facilitate the uptake of innovative finance mechanisms. Um, as you very well know, um, financing conservation is challenging um, and because you're not extracting something that you can sell. And so, um, you know, what are the innovative mechanisms, maybe insurance products, things like that, that can um, incentivize the private sector market-based investment here. And then finally, um, as I mentioned before, there's been very low levels of climate adaptation financing, and so we're really hoping to, to unlock a lot of financing from that for coral reefs. Um, the next slide uh, will um, you know, show sort of the, the, the ambition of the, of the fund here. And um, the idea here is to have a, roughly a, a $500 million fund. We're still at the, at the you know, fundraising stage here. So there's, there's, the money is not available right now. And I'll explain the timing in, in a bit. And um, the uh, goal here is to have 125 million in, in philanthropy and concessionary funding that um, combines with about 375 million um, of private investment to, to create the sort of $500 million target. And that, that money strategically invested and um, through, through a combination of grants, as I said, concessional financing and direct investment, um, hopefully will leverage another two to $3 billion um, from, from global public and private financial instruments. So that's the, the rough estimate of the, of the fund. In the next slide, um, we'll talk a little bit about some of the uh, outcomes that the fund is hoping to achieve. The, this is, comes from the fund's theory of change. Uh, that document, as well as uh, detailed terms of references, can be found, uh, they're accessible on the landing page site that, that I'll show you in a little bit, and uh, there'll be a, a, a link to it at the end of the presentation. 
Um, so here's some outcomes. So protect priority coral reef sites and climate change uh, resilient refugia. So certain certain coral sites are, are, are likely to be more resistant to climate change than others. Uh, two, transformation uh, towards sustainable livelihoods for, for reef dependent communities. So really focusing on uh, sustainability, uh, sustainable livelihoods for, for those uh, populations that are dependent and adjacent to reefs. Um, third is the coral reef restoration and adaptation technologies. Clearly a lot of advances needed there. And, and finally, the fourth outcome is the recovery of coral reef dependent communities to major shocks. So that's resilience. How can we invest in ways to increase the resilience of um, these coral reef communities and the coral reefs themselves? So the next slide covers um, a few different activities that are currently underway with the fund. And um, uh, so one is uh, um, we're, the, the fund uh, proponents are developing proposals to the U United Nations Joint uh, Sustainable Development Gold Fund, the SDG Fund, um, with uh, some opportunities in Fiji and, and, and Papua New Guinea. Um, we are developing an investment plan uh, that the Conservation Finance Alliance is, is, is providing technical support for to create a 10 year vision and to identify a potential project portfolio for the fund. Um, there's a, a Green Climate Fund proposal that's being developed. Um, for concessional loans and, and guarantees to de-risk the investments and encourage that private sector investment. And there's ongoing fundraising um, from all the partners reaching out to member states and, and private uh, philanthropies to, to increase that uh, the, uh, the public and, and philanthropic part of the fund. And um, there's a design of the investment window, which is taking place through collaboration with, um, with BNP Paribas and Ophelia. And um, the fund is also working on a communication strategy and material, and you know, which will include website and things like that. So, um, so that's sort of a background on the fund. And um, as I mentioned before, I'll, I'll give a bit more of an introduction to the investment plan and the survey. But we could take a little pause right now for some que some initial questions or clarifications. Um, so, Petra, over to you. Uh, next slide, I think, is just a, a question. We're just doing, uh, does anybody have any clarifying questions on what David's just presented? And um, then he'll dive into the details on, on more of the next steps for the fund. But I think I have one person raising their hand. Um, Patrick, I'll unmute you. Let's see if it works. Patrick Cody, did you have a question? Oh, wait, here's one. Sorry, can you repeat that? Yes, I'm sorry, no question. Oh, okay, all right. Here's one, David. How does concessionary capital de-risk investments? Right, great question. Um, so the um, so concessionary capital of, often comes from, uh, say, a development bank or, or, or a, finance, a development finance institution like the World Bank or, or things like that. And the idea is that um, it, it takes away some of the risk. So for example, um, for funds, and USAID has done this for many, many funds, for example, um, Althelia, where they, they, they say, well, we'll guarantee the loss of 50% of the, of the amount of the fund um, if things go really bad. So the downside, if, if the private sector invests this money, the fund invests, and things go really bad, the most anyone could lose would be half of the money that they put in. So although you'd still lose money, um, the risk has just been cut in half. And, and, that, and that guarantee um, really, if, if things go well, the guarantee actually didn't really cost much. So it's just that the weight of the financial institution saying, we've got this covered, decreases the risk, gives the, the private investors more confidence that if things go really south, which is something you always want to consider if things go really bad, um, will I lose all my money? In this case, no. So um, it really is a, a, these kind of de-risking instruments are very, very useful for uh, creating, uh, for lowering the risk and enticing the private sector to invest in areas that they're not comfortable with, that they don't understand or that they've seen higher risk in. And the, you know, so that's how, that's how that works for the most part.
Uh, Petra, I think you're you're muted still. <laughs> Sorry. I want to do one more question from um, Constantine. Um, you have your hand raised. I'm going to unmute you. And Constantine, can you unmute yourself too? All right. Okay. Oh, hi. Hi. Go ahead. Hi. Uh, yeah, David. Thanks a lot for the presentation. Um, you showed the slide with these with the funding from 125 million going up to 3 billion where are you at the moment uh, uh, concerning the funding how, how far have you gone what have you reached yeah, i'm just looking for um my colleagues from the un to see um if they're on yet but um so it's a uh, I, I'm, I'm actually not quite sure myself, um, and I'm going to give uh, uh, Maxime a chance if you if you would like to respond to that to to uh, do this. So Maxime Philippe uh, works for the UN and is um, supporting the the coral the Global Fund for Coral Reefs. Maxime, over to you. Sure. Thanks, David. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. We can. Great. Um, so I'm the fund design coordinator for the Global Fund for Coral Reefs, and we are in the fundraising stage. Um, by January of 2021, we expect to have the first infusion of uh, donations or from donors. And then early in the year, we expect to send out requests for uh, letters of uh, letters of interest and request full rest full requests for proposals. Thanks, Maxine. Great. So and David, um, opportunity is still there to invest. Well. Oh, sorry, David. Here's online as well if you wanted um, him to chime in at all right now as Great. well. Excellent. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Appreciate it. Should we we'll go on with the rest of the presentation then? And yeah, that's what I was going to say. So I'm getting a lot of questions, but there are a lot of specifics about the funds. So let's keep going and then I'm going to get through your questions. Don't worry, everyone. Excellent. Okay, thanks. So, um, so let me talk about the request for information and the idea of the um, investment plan. Um, the, uh, we're, we're currently at the stage for the fund of trying to understand the opportunity, trying to identify um, potential investments and build a, a model portfolio. So um, the, the, as I mentioned before, the CFA was, was engaged to develop a, a investment plan and that this will include sort of two main areas. One is, uh, Evaluating um, proposed sites um, for concentrated efforts, and the second is looking at sort of business models and financial instruments that could be used that have that are that are coral positive. Let's call them coral positive. So they, they contribute to the objectives of the fund, which is you know I mentioned before um, conservation, restoration, as well as a, you know resilience um, of the coral and the communities around them and, and improved livelihood. So. So we're looking for business models, businesses, and finance instruments that can have that positive impact so that we can bring the private sector in um, to complement and, and add to the money that the philanthropic and uh, public sources can provide. We, need, we know we need a lot of money um, invested in coral reefs. We, we know we need uh, strong engagement from the private sector and collaboration. And um, basically, it's the, the whole goal here is to figure out how to have public-private um, partnerships that that really um, drive the change that we're looking for. And so, um, and, and and as uh, as Maxi mentioned, you know, this is not a call for proposals. This is this is just a request for information. We're in the we're in the early stage of trying to uh, identify opportunities, and um, it's really important to to share with us your your thoughts and your your ideas. And so we've set up these two. Uh, surveys, uh, one for site selection and one for business models, and um, we're going to walk you through some some of the, the main elements of those different surveys. Those are available uh, at the uh, GFCR landing page uh, on on the Conservation Finance Alliance website for now, and I'll show you them links at the very at the end um, to to access those. So, um, and and these surveys are. 
we tried to keep them relatively short so that um, you know they wouldn't be a huge burden to to respond to. So in many cases, we will reach out to to you, people that are proposing ideas and sites afterwards for more information. And there's also uh, an email address we'll share at the end where you can, can send us more information about your sites or your projects um, in addition to the survey. So these online surveys are relatively limited and uh, we'll, we'll, there's going to be a, a much more intensive reach out um, to you. And But really, we need you to, to fill these out if you can so that we know who to contact um, about which uh, areas and projects. All right, so moving on to the next slide, I'm going to start with the site selection um, area. And um, whoops, I think that was a click through there. Um, but um, the next slide, we get, yeah, so we, we, we try to identify sites. And the idea here is to um, concentrate efforts to allow both piloting of, of interesting ideas and projects and investments as well as increasing the chances for success. So um, the so we have this concept of a focal area, which could be defined as a biogeographical unit where one or multiple investments are desired and are mutually reinforcing. So uh, that this could contain multiple MPAs, marine protected areas, multiple coral reefs, for example, and definitely multiple business models because we, we are looking for, for synergies among different uh, initiatives. Um, it, should be unified ecologically for certain and um, probably administratively. I've, I've used a, a, a map of the Mesoamerican reef here from the MAR fund. And um, just as an example, I mean, here you see uh, an ecologically unified uh, reef that, uh, you know, expands four different countries right here. So you have uh, Mexico, Belize, Guatemala, and Honduras. Um, and in theory, there could be finance instruments that, that could support the entirety of the reef. For example, the MAR fund is a finance instrument. Um, but um, when you're looking at, at business operations such, and, um, and you know, looking at protected areas as from, from a business perspective in a way, you may want to focus within one administrative unit. And so the, the goal here um, is to try to figure out whether this could possibly be a, a, an entire focal area or whether the focal area should, should be concentrated, for example, the, the Belize, Belize is part of the Mesoamerican reef or something like that. So, um, so, that's, so it's, the answer is not clear, um, but, but the, um, the idea here is that it would be focused enough to have an impact and there may be sites within um, these different countries as well that are targeted. So again, we'll, we'll have to, um, Look at the information we generate from the surveys. Next slide um, will goes goes into a little bit more detail about um, the, the, the site selection criteria. We're looking for places that uh, you know resilient against climate change, that have very uh, strong biodiversity, that the site itself is ready in terms of it's got existing technical capacity. There are organizations on the ground uh, doing conservation, doing monitoring, that kind of thing conservation and, and development, sustainable development for that site should be part of national priority, should be uh, politically aligned with the, the, the country. And um, others are, are ecosystem service values. Now this could include everything from uh, storm protection through uh, sites of significant cultural heritage, uh, whether or not there's monitoring and evaluation potential, sites that are extremely remote, um, it may be different, uh, difficult. However, there are, there's there's technologies that could be used. And then um, the sites also should be areas where uh, the, the initiative should ha could have a positive influence and impact on the local reef dependent communities. And um, you know that, that finally that there's a potential to address current ecosystem degradation using these holistic market driven solutions. So getting business involved is gonna have a positive impact. So those are the general site selection criteria. Um, and uh, the next slide uh, goes into some detail about the categories in, in this uh, survey. Basically, we're asking for some basic contact information, the location, um, the specific area of the site, what are you proposing, um, what kind of conservation activities ongoing in, in, in the area, there are marine protected areas, uh, locally managed marine areas, things like that, Who, who's responsible for management, are there international designations, recognition of the site? 
information on biodiversity, these drivers of degradation, which I'll, I'll get into in more detail again. Going forward, a little bit on the, the bleaching history, human presence, the local economy, and, and what existing business models may, may currently exist in the site. So this is very site focused, um, very conservation focused, but, but we're trying to get an idea of what the economic sort of situation is as well. Again, basic information, we, and we'll probably follow up with, with the most promising sites afterwards. Next slide um, goes into some more detail on some of these. Um, the drivers of degradation, you'll, you'll see both on the site selection survey and on the business model survey. And we're trying to understand what, what are the main drivers in the, the, that site. This is a, quite a comprehensive list. Um, and uh, so as you go through, you want to kind of check these. Next slide covers the, um, you know, the, the questions we're going to ask around biodiversity. So um, you know, things like uh, coral species richness. If you have that information, you share it. If you don't have it, you don't have to do, do research. Um, this is sort of like all desk, all currently what you know. Um, please don't spend a huge amount of time um, to try to come up with these numbers if you don't know them. Um, sharks and apex predators, herbivorous fish, um, current disturbance, and uh, whether there's flagship or endangered species on the side. Next slide is, just covers, um, just gives you an example of, of the, Choices that are available for human presence, for example, um, you know, could be isolated. There's no permanent residence all the way through um, large urban areas of 200,000. So um, we want to know sort of how many people are around. And the next uh, slide uh, is uh, some of the indicators we're looking at around the economy, primarily focused on tourism and fisheries. Um, and uh, again, if you have this information, please share it with us. If you don't, um, it's not a problem. Um, uh, just let us know. Next slide here is um, going to well, going to jump to the business model section here. So, um, so all that previously was was around the site selection survey, uh, the request for information on sites, and the next few slides here are going to talk about the business model selection. And so, it's business model and financial instruments and. Um, here we're, we are um, uh, we're looking for existing businesses, existing models, existing finance instruments, but also ones that are being developed, ones that are being created. So, um, uh, and, and the current criteria here for prioritizing these are, are going to be what is their impact on the degradation drivers and coral reef protection. So how is that business model going to help out uh, coral? and the communities around it, right? Um, that there's a, again, it's a blended finance mechanism. So um, although there'll be grants as part of the, the fund, uh, the target here is to create opportunities for blended investment for private and public joint investment to achieve the, the goals. Um, so what's the ratio of needed grants, for example, relative to investment capital? That's something we'd, we'd like to know. Um, market analysis. <coughs> And financial sustainability. It, obviously, uh, good businesses um, and good models are uh, are critical here. Um, not every it's startup businesses are very hard. It's very difficult to find businesses that are pro biodiversity, pro coral. Um, so it's going to be interesting there. And potential for scaling up and replication. Um, so could, there could be small pilots, um, but if they have great potential for for, for repeatability um, across the country or across a larger area, then um, that's much more interesting. Um, and then the positive impact for, for, the, for the communities, especially um, this could lead to a lot of opportunity to invest in sustainable development and sustainable livelihoods that are aligned with coral conservation. And then finally, gender and social inclusion um, is actually reflected in the business concept and business idea. So those are the criteria for the business model selection. The next slide is going to go into some of the detail of the categories of information we're looking for. Um, so again, contact information. We're asking for a summary. Uh, it's relatively concise. We, we look for. We like to have a, a nice paragraph that just summarizes the entire concept, um, sharing your experience uh, and implementation, um, describing the, the the business model. We have a category system, the alignment with the stated outcomes of the fund itself and um, how the model will address the threats, 
some information on what sort of level of financing needs the project will have or the business model will have and the projected timeline and projected returns. Again, if you don't have this information, if it's an early stage, please just provide what you have and then uh, then key partners. Um, I'm trying to, the next slide, we're gonna keep going. Um, I, I realized that um, I'm trying to go a little fast because there are a lot of folks and a lot of questions. So I wanna give you guys plenty of time for questions here. Um, these are some examples of sort of business sectors that business models could fit into, ecotourism, you know, sustainable fisheries, aquaculture, uh, but it could be other, other causes of, 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 of the threats, the drivers of, of degradation, you know, waste management, wastewater treatment, could, could, they, they are known to have a harmful effect, runoff, things like that. So there may be business opportunities that address these, these direct and indirect threats that are uh, you know, positive opportunities for the private sector and positive uh, outcomes for coral. So the challenge is, is trying to align um, these revenue generating opportunities with coral conservation, resilience, and the community um, development. So um, it's not, it, these are not obvious solutions. There, if, if there were pure private investments in all these areas that, you know, um, didn't need support from, say, concessionary finance or, or public uh, monies, um, then the private sector would be doing them and we wouldn't need the fund. But in fact, that's, that's not the case. It's very hard to get pro-coral, uh, coral positive uh, investments uh, happening. So that's what, what the fund is doing. Hopefully, once uh, we've, we've shown the way and, and piloted it, then it will pave the way for much more investment. Next slide um, goes into uh, question of whether to submit a site submission or a model submission. Um, if, you're, if you've got active conservation programs, you, you, there may be multiple potential business models, you're not sure which will work, you're a locality or municipality or a province or something like that, then I would um, definitely uh, go for a site submission. Um, if your business, if you've got a business model or, or a financial instrument that you've been thinking of, and it could have different sites, different multiple areas, obviously, um, so a lot of businesses are tied to one site, so you could submit both a site submission and a business model submission. Um, that's absolutely fine. Um, and um, so those are your, your choices. And the next slide, um, I think, will uh, brings us to a, a, a modalities for the uh, what the fund, how the fund may invest. So obviously, I've mentioned grants before. Our target amount is roughly twenty five percent relative to, to other the private investment, the concessionary financing. Recoverable grants um, are another option. These are innovative approaches. Um, we, the, the fund may consider financing partners such as incubators, other funds, and technical assistance facility to build that pipeline of viable investment opportunities. And then of course, there's the concessionary finance that I'd mentioned previously, uh, uh, financial guarantees, uh, low interest loans, things that, that will, um, de-risk and improve the returns relative to risk for the private investors and then the private instruments like debt and equity, uh, for example. Um, the next, I think we have just two more slides. The next slide is um, a, uh, shows the, the landing page, the website that's that's been created. And um, Sherry, if you could just click on that real quick, we're gonna just do a quick tour. Um, the site has additional documents and and um, a lot of information on it. It's just one page, but it does have uh, uh, frequently asked questions uh, for each of the surveys. If you could scroll down just a little. Um, on the right, you can see these shortcuts to, um, to the FAQs, some background information. Um, you could, if you go down further, so both for business model site selection, you can um, get more details on the global fund through, um, just slide down just a bit more, um, on the right there, there's um, the uh, brochure that's available. There's the terms of reference, which is a quite uh, comprehensive document that that outlines, you know, the, the how the fund will will work, um, and then the fund's theory of change, from which we pulled um, some of those uh, outcomes before. And just a little bit further below, you can see there's the the link to the request for the information, um, the business model survey and um, the site selection survey. And um, below that, you can see this Microsoft Word version. So if you wanna download them, fill them out, um, 
uh, at home, you can email it to uh, secretariat at cfalliance.org. Um, we'll show that uh, at the very end as well. Um, and that's also a, a, a email destination that you could add, you could put um, additional uh, you could send additional information to. So we'll we'll try to um, keep that. But please fill out the survey first before you send us additional information. Um, and I think that's that's pretty much it. Uh, hopefully we have a good 25 minutes or so for questions. And I'm very um, happy that um, um, that, that if, if, uh, Pierre. Um, uh, Bardot is uh, on the call as well, and Pierre is from the the UN Multi Donor Trust Fund, and will be able to answer some additional questions about the fund and the partners that have launched it. Um, so, um, Petra, over to you. Great, thank you, David. Um, we've got a couple questions that have been hanging around. So, um, Francis, if you still have your question, I'm going to unmute you, Francis. Can you, you're unmuted. If you unmute yourself as well, would you like to ask your question? Uh, I guess that's me, but I guess it was a mistake. I have no questions. Sorry about that. Okay. No worries. Good to see you. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. I'm going to do, I had one more hand up before I go to the list. Or, um, Ariel, would you like to ask your question? You are unmuted. Okay, well, if they well, we can try that again in a second. So, David, here's your first question. Will the will there be funds for developing feasibility studies? Um, yeah, great question. I um, I actually don't don't know the answer to that yet. That's that's still um, it's certainly a possibility. And um, you know we, we we know that that uh, the pipeline has to be developed, and so uh, there's something like like a feasibility study probably will be part of the grant part. Yeah. Great. Does every project have to be blended finance, or could some be grant only? Um, another good question. Of course, all questions are good. Um, the the goal here is is blended finance. So um, although you could imagine within a site the necessity for developing certain, um, uh, let's say, uh, certain underlying conditions, maybe even government regu regulations. So let's say on on the uh, on fisheries management that are necessary to make a private investment feasible. And so, so it is possible that um, that those projects would be done in combination with the goal of achieving. Um, a uh, private investment opportunity. Okay, thanks. Um, when should these surveys be submitted by? Ah, very good question. Um, we have it. We've, we're going to close the the request for information at the end of September, so September thirtieth. So please, you know, submit before then. The sooner, the better. That enables us to sort of start start reaching out to you and uh, gathering more information. Do you have examples of revenues that might attract investors? Um, yes, um, and uh, as I mentioned before, it's it's not obvious, it's not easy. Um, there are some uh, interesting approaches out there. Um, the sort of more obvious ones are, are ecotourism, um, revenues that uh, you know generated from from having. Uh, healthy coral reefs that attract divers you know obviously protected areas can can charge entrance fees diving fees and other activity fees um, and there is a, an interesting program right now run by blue finance um, an ngo based in france that that is using um, you know tourism uh, when it comes back um, as a major um, source of, of of funds to help uh, uh, provide a, an opportunity for the private sector to invest in protected areas. So it's a public-private partnership that, um, uh, with the first example in Dominican Republic, that uh, allows um, an initial cash investment up front, a debt investment, and then the reimbursement and the payoff of that debt with interest um, based on uh, 
capturing revenue from tourism fees. A couple, you know, there's 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 others, of course. Um, they're uh, less less innovative, but um, you know, straight tourism it can be beneficial to conservation and could be detrimental as well. So it's a question of um, of doing it. Um, obviously, sustainable fisheries, if they're well managed, can produce additional revenue um, for the fishers. Um, you can increase productivity um, by setting, you know, putting aside no take zones or no take periods. Examples uh, include, you know, octopus management, that classic example from uh, um, Blue Ventures and uh, and others. But yeah, so there's there there are models out there, um, and uh, um, we're hoping to pull them all together here from you, from all your ideas. Great. Um, what is the process following submission of the surveys? Like in January, will there be RFPs? Um, the terms of reference doc refers to concept notes. How does it all fit in the process? A lot of that is still being worked out. I think maybe I'm going to reach out to, to Pierre here to see if he wants to add something. But um, a lot of the details are still being worked out, the timing especially. And um, I don't think anything would be ready by January, but um, definitely in 2021. And uh, um, yeah, I'm not sure you, if you want to add to that or, or Maxime? Yes, I can, uh, I can add quickly to, to your point, David. So um, as you mentioned, the fund was uh, legally established in uh, July, August this year. We are making an official presentation of the fund this month during the high level um during the high level event uh, at the general assembly that's going to be a virtual event and, and open to the general public then following that we're going to continue the work on the investment plan and in parallel build our capitalization strategy to be in a position in january to both look at the priorities that will that will emerge from the investment uh, from the work on the investment plan and and um, and have a pledging event uh, in January and get the fund fully capitalized. So we have already early uh, pledges, but all of this would be um, fully closed, hopefully um, early 2021, for operationalization in the ground by let's say mid um, by June next year. Thank you. Thank you. Um, one question here is, do you have any case studies of what has already been done that achieved measured coral and financial outcomes? Are there any specific projects or companies in the pipeline, or is this all still hypothetical? Um, no, there's, there's, there's quite, of, uh, <clears throat> quite a few examples. There's a really a good uh, paper, review paper um, that uh, WCS and uh, I was involved with a little bit called, um, let's see, Coral, Coral Refinance, it's Guide to Coral Refinance, something like that. Um, it's available on the CFA website. Um, we go through about 12 different financial finance instruments and there's case studies uh, throughout that document. So I, I highly recommend uh, reading that. Um, there, there's a you know some really interesting approaches that are that are innovative. There's other approaches that are, you know like tourism that have, that have been around for a long time, um, and um, that you know the, a lot of them involve government and they're they're you know not private sector investment opportunities. And that's kind of what the challenge is here is to try to see you know how to leverage that private money and how to find. Um, how to engage businesses in achieving sustainable coral management um, by creating a, a an opportunity for them. So it's a uh, you know there's examples out there, but as I mentioned before, it's it's challenging, and um, you know we'd really love to hear some good ideas from, from everyone. Great, thanks, David. Um, I'm going to try to call on one of our hands that are raised. Um, Sybil, would you like to ask your question? Yes, thank you, Dave. I mean, that's fascinating. And uh, looking at your criteria for selecting a site, uh, I think I can say we had it for 20 years. This is Chupa Island Coral Park in Zanzibar, Tanzania, which I invested into. And we ran it for 20 years as a no-take MPA, a privately protected areas based on ecotourism, a small lodge, and it worked for 20 years 
fully financed professional management, rangers, education programs, livelihoods for local people. It worked for 20 years. Now, this has collapsed because tourism has disappeared from our part of the world. And as you know, coral reefs are in the global south, which I think we can say might may take years to recover. It may take years with the pandemic and other things to recover to the levels of tourism we need to fund the park. We have been looking into options like uh, uh, blue finance, uh, carbon credits, but uh, the application procedures and the certification you need are quite prohibitive for small sites. You know, our needs are not millions. There are a few hundred thousands a year or so. So we're just below the threshold of funding for big funders. However, this is a fully funded, privately running successful mod model for 20 years. It was the first fully funded, I mean, sustainable uh, marine park in the world uh, in the, from the year 2000. But at the moment, as we depended on ecotourism, our funding uh, basically has disappeared. And it's very hard to imagine another one which would not be uh, like uh, carbon credits, like a level of subsidies. You know, it's not, I, I couldn't imagine a business model for our part of the world because it wouldn't open up for fishing. I mean, it has been a no-take site and uh, uh, that's also, mm, it's not easy to find other uh, sources of income from tourism. Thank you. Yeah, Sybil, thank you very much. And, and um, yes, your, your, your project in, in, um, in Zanzibar is just uh, an amazing one. And um, cer certainly, you know, blue carbon, well, you made a couple of really great points. One is that a lot of the challenge here is scale. Um, you know, we're, a lot of the initiatives, uh, even ecotourism or um, even, you know, protected area management, community livelihoods are all very, very small scale. So how do we, as a, as a global fund here, um, enable uh, private or otherwise any deals at that level, uh, at the small level? And so that's part of what we need to figure out and, and why we may need to work through intermediaries and partners to to enable who are, are better positioned to uh, make these smaller uh, level investments so but uh, and blue carbon is definitely an area that there's a lot of interest in and there's a lot of opportunity there uh, again it, it comes with challenges uh, scale um, mangroves tend not to be huge huge uh, in many areas and um, are obviously one of the best opportunities for blue carbon but but it's definitely uh, a growing opportunity there. Okay, David, I want to get us through some other really good questions here. So I'm going to keep us moving. So um, how are private investors motivated to invest in the fund with limited revenue generating opportunities? Um, well, um, so I'm not sure what, what the person means by limited revenue generating opportunities, but um, let's say that um, the kinds of deals that, that we know of are, tend to be small. They tend to have relatively low returns relative to their risk. Um, and so, so, so there's challenges to get the private sector to invest in there. On the other hand, there's been a growing interest in impact investing. So this is, this is defined as uh, making for-profit investments that include a positive impact, socially, environmentally, or, or, or otherwise. So, um, and, and there's strong demand for investment in nature positive, uh, but return-based deals. So um, there are, and, and, and the indications, so this indication is there's clear demand there um, from the investing community. There's a lot of money available, but it has to meet the conditions that they need. And this is why the concessionary element of the fund um, can provide uh, a way to decrease the risk or increase the relative returns and provide the private sector the incentive to, to get involved. Um, it's, uh, so, so there's interest, there's desire, there's a lot of money, um, but, but it, it, the challenge is on us in a way to create uh, the opportunities that, that meet the perspective and, and the historical need of the private sector. Okay. Um, what is the position on blue natural capital awareness in Africa and how governments realign their priorities? Okay. Um, 
I'm not, I'm not sure I'm, I'm equipped to answer that question. Um, okay. But uh, yeah, I mean, obviously we need government to, to, uh, to recognize how important uh, that blue natural capital is. And, um, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the lack of business opportunity, business investment opportunities is because blue natural capital and other natural capital is not adequately valued. It's not adequately um, regulated. And um, so, for example, damaging um, reefs may not have uh, economic penalties in, in a lot of places. So these are some very simple mechanisms that governments can put in place to, to try to uh, increase the value and, and increase the integrate the value of, of uh, blue natural capital into business decisions. Great. Will hybrid green gray reef creation enhancement or restoration be considered for the fund? Um, as far as I know, definitely. You know um, that uh, coral restoration is is definitely an objective here, and uh, um, you know there's a lot of initiatives being explored um, to, uh, to to see what what physical uh, approaches are going to work the best for reef restoration. And um, the question is, where's the business model? How, you know, how do you find a business model there? And so there's also people exploring that as well. And some maybe even type of pay for success type type opportunities. Um, coral uh, restoration can provide coastal protection. How do we capture that through maybe reducing insurance premiums? It's the, uh, an ideal um, uh, challenging though. Um, but there, there's other ways. Hotels are, could, could potentially um, pay to assure high quality reef out in front of their hotels, things like that. Great. Would the expansion of an existing blended finance model be eligible for grants? And can you explain the 25% pipeline modality a little bit more detailed? Um, yeah, I, mean, I, I, I don't know if Pierre or, or, or Maxime want to take this, but I'm, I'm happy to if you don't. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, David. OK, so. Um, so the first part of the question was, um, sorry, Patrick, I have focused on the second part. Go ahead. The first part again was? Um, it was, would, a, oh, sorry, now I've got to find it in my list. Oh, it was Is existing it, blended oh, finance, right. So, yeah, so existing, yeah. It would be expanded and be eligible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't see why not. Um, you know, the if something's working and it needs to expand, I mean, that we, we do want to, uh, rep, we do want to replicate, we want to expand, we want to scale. So. If something currently exists that's, that's uh, in, in process, uh, of course, the, we the, see, look, examine the opportunity for expansion. And um, just getting to that 25% question, this is a, a rough target. The, the idea is that um, you know the grants, the grant part of the fund would be, and the concessional financing would really be trying to, to, to set up opportunities for the private sector to come, private part of the fund to come in and outside private investors to, to, to invest as well. Um, that, you know, 25% is just a, a rough, a rough estimate of what, what our target is. Is that, is that enough? Is it, uh, can we do it with less? Um, you know, if we, if we can do it with less, we can perhaps expand the amount of private money coming in. So it's just a rough target. So we were starting to think about it. Great. Um, David, what's the anticipated size or range of the grants, and are they single year or multi year? All right, it, it's um, definitely too early to, um, to to know details like that. Um, so that's this is part of what we're, we're going to map out in the investment plan. Okay. Um, there also is a question about the slide on the site survey versus business model and what to submit. Uh, requesting that we go back to that slide. And I think what would be good to clarify is when you say submit at this point, you're saying to submit surveys for, is that correct? Or Yes, the sur right. So the, sur the survey is the request for information. We're requesting information from, from partners and, and, and uh, practitioners and private businesses. Um, so yes, yeah, so we submit a survey would be submitting in this request for information. Um, you know, one of the benefits, of course, is it, it uh, not only does it share the information that, that, that for, of your sites and your projects, um, but it, you know, we'll, we'll be able to um, reach out to you again 
we'll, uh, if you're willing, we can, your name could be on the mailing list so that you could be informed of updates on the fund and um, things like that. So um, I'm not sure that, that, I, that I answered the question, Petra, but. Um, I think this is good. Yeah, I just wanted to have them see the slide again and yeah. Um, okay, so um, now this is a question about revenue. Where Where is the revenue going to come from to generate returns for the private investors? Um, and also investors would like to know who's managing their money and their track record. So who specifically is managing the global fund for coral reefs? Right. So the on the private, so I can answer the, the second one uh, first. On the private side, it's BNP Paribas, uh, is sort of the, the overall um, investment manager. Hopefully, I got that right. Um, and Althea Morova, who have uh, run currently the Sustainable Ocean Fund and have experience um, in uh, this kind of uh, conservation-based investing, um, are are going to be kind of working together with BNP Paribas to come up with the private management approach there. So the, um, the concessionary funding and the, and the philanthropic will work together with them um, to, to, to make uh, the modalities work out. Um, and then what was the first part of the question again? Um, sorry, I Put that the first part was uh oh sorry i put that one oh, in revenue one. streams revenue yeah. streams yeah i got it so <laughs> right so uh, what are the revenues um I that the private it. sector invested i mean you know that this is um uh there's a lot of um you know a lot of the benefits that you that you see from coral reefs um can turn into revenue streams it's a lot of the benefits are public goods and are, are, are shared resources and are harder to to um to find revenues for but um, you know, the, for example, if we take some, and if you look at, at some of the um, the threats and the um, the causes of degradation, addressing those causes of degradation could be business opportunities. For example, um, if you've got agricultural runoff, um, oftentimes that's that's a result of excess fertilizer. So you're putting too much fertilizer or pesticide on your agricultural property, or you don't have adequate buffers, and it's relatively easy to uh, you know, if, if to work with again, you have to work with the governments um, to just maybe reduce subsidies to those agricultural uh, entrants. Um, but but um, you can incentivize the farmers; um, they'll actually save money if they can get their the, the levels right. And um, you can kind of set up a payment for ecosystem services approach, that kind of thing. You've got the, the often the challenges with with environmental costs and benefits is that they're often external to businesses, external to um, to, to um, the, the source of the problem and, and by internalizing them, you create business opportunities. You create business costs too, but, um, but uh, there are opportunities for new technology, opportunities for um, better management. Okay, we're getting really close. I'm gonna try to fit in two small questions. Um, is there an option to add under organization or name different organizations? For example, if somebody's part of a co-management area and would like to submit as co-managers or a consortium, is this possible? Um, definitely. We did not create the opportunity in the survey to um, have you know multiple uh, people or multiple email. Um, just, uh, I would say, make a note of it in the survey, and then and then email us the the rest of the of the people that you want to be included in the consortium, so that we can um, include their email and contact them as needed. Right. And then there's quite a few questions around regions and sites. Like, is this available to small deep water reefs in Africa? Where do you want to work? So, can you just clarify for folks again on how regions or sites? will be determined or like, yeah. how do yes. they know if their place works for the fund? <laughs> yeah, um, so the, the I can't I can't provide uh, enough uh, detail at this stage. We're, we're still exploring a range of, of these issues, looking at a complicated, a, a complex of, uh, of elements. There is also a, a sort of a scientific advisory committee that the that, uh, United Nations Environment is uh, leading and um, we'll we'll look at the the uh, you know, resilience issues. We'll look at the 
um, diversity issues and things like that. So, and then, and then, um, so yeah, I, I just, I, I can't, I couldn't provide anything much more than that at this point. Okay. So we are at the end of our hour. We didn't get through all the questions. There's a lot of questions that we didn't get to. So apologies, everyone. But if you would like to ask your question, um, you can email secretariat at uh, cfaalliance.org and check out the site that David's shown you today. And so as I mentioned, the um, recording for the webinar will be sent out to the Reef Resilience um, email list after um, this webinar today. If you're not on the list and would like to be, please uh, join our mailing list at reefresilience.org. And I want to thank um, David and our other uh, question respondents today for joining us. And thank you all for participating. Um, there's a short survey at the end of this webinar. So please fill that out for us so we can get feedback. And I hope everybody has a great day. Thank you, David. Thank you, Petra. Thanks, everyone.